On the agenda tonight, we're going back to the 60s. We're going to be taking a look at the Beatles and they're going to be performing She Loves You. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So this is going to be an interesting one because I've been linked to this channel of the Beatles playing and there's various live performances of the Beatles as well as Beatles songs on this channel and they haven't been blocked and it doesn't seem to be any kind of copyright attributed to the videos and whether it's just not been spotted yet, it might be that case and then everything will get blocked in the future. But this performance is apparently the Beatles' best performance ever. So we're going to be taking a look at it and we'll be looking at She Loves You and then we'll be just breaking things down and jumping into it as we normally do. But let's get the guys up on screen and see how they get on. And there we have it. As always, there's going to be a link to this performance in the description below. That's if it's still there. And this has been uploaded in the UK, I do believe. So I don't know whether it's going to be watchable in other countries. But this performance, as for saying it's the best performance ever, as you'll all know, having watched this channel for a while, you can't really say that any performance is the best ever because it is subjective. So whatever you might think is the best performance, I might think is the second best performance and so on and so forth. And the debate never ends. But in terms of the Beatles as a live band, they were just on a totally different level because of the fact that when they were performing, it was so second nature and so much of the performance was subconscious that they could concentrate on smiling and enjoying the performance and having that camaraderie between band members, having that rapport with each other and the audience can tap into all these kind of things. When you're watching guys on stage that are having a great time, the audience is going to have a great time as well. It just so happens that because these guys were so well rehearsed, they could do this on stage and they were never phased by anything and anything that happened in the crowd didn't throw them off. When I say that they are rehearsed, 
I mean they are rehearsed at playing live. So if you've watched any other video that I've done on the Beatles, you'll know about the fact that they used to go over to Germany and by the time they became big, they had already just honed their craft, their live performance. They were so used to playing live, night in, night out, that when they then exploded onto the scene, they didn't have to get used to the massive crowds or performing in front of people, they could already do it, they were already comfortable. So they were so well rehearsed at playing live. And it's something that if you speak to any person who's been in a band, any musician for any length of time and they've gigged regularly, they will always tell you that you learn at probably about five times the speed playing live than you do in the rehearsal studio. You can rehearse for months and then you can get out there and play a gig and you can mess things up because of the fact that something will happen, it will put you off, and it didn't happen in the rehearsal studio because in the rehearsal studio, there aren't any variables. It's just the same setup every time. You close the door, you rehearse for a few hours, and then that's it. Whereas when you're playing a gig, somebody might throw something, there might be a, a, an equipment failure. So many things can happen that can throw you off your game. But if you've rehearsed actually playing live, so that's effectively re your rehearsal, just playing night after night in front of people, then all these things that go wrong have already happened to you. So you don't get phased by it. And this is something that the Beatles had in their locker just to perform at this kind of level live also musically just having it so accurately down to the record and the fact that you can debate whether this is the best performance ever or not it really does show you how great the Beatles were live because this sounds exactly like the record and in the in the studio they just set up and play and they'd record it and then you have them in your front room as if they're playing live so when they play live it just sounds exactly the same so the fact that there will be huge debates as to what is their best performance is because every performance was great and you can make an argument for everything the Beatles were at the cutting edge of live performance to the point where the equipment was not designed for the Beatles in terms of having screaming women that would be so loud, they were louder than the PA system that they were using in order to hear the vocals. And this gave, obviously, the band a problem being able to hear themselves because, as you can see in this shot on the screen, at the front of the stage there isn't a fold-back monitor where it plays back or at least it reflects the voice of the lead singer and the singers so that they can hear themselves clearly. That's something that came along a little bit later on so that you could hear your voice above screaming fans. But the Beatles didn't have that. So it meant that they are effectively trying to sing here, not really being able to hear their own vocal, which just puts it on a totally different level. If you've ever put your fingers in your ears or played really loud music in headphones and then tried to sing and recorded it and then played it back, you'll realize how difficult it is to sing perfectly in key, not being able to hear your own voice. But these guys just seem to be able to do that. And not only that, but harmonize with each other without the technology that a lot of later bands would then have the luxury of being able to hear their own voice clearly. So they were ahead of the times in more ways than one, which we will have a look at in this video as well. But just from a performance perspective, not being able to hear anything. So they really pushed the boundaries of the music industry at the time, but also the manufacturers of the musical equipment to make a PA that could be heard and was louder than tens of thousands of women screaming because at this point it really just didn't exist and generally when you're watching these videos back we're getting the feed from the mixer so this is why you can hear it all nice and clearly and I'm sure on the night it would have been so much more difficult especially on stage to hear it but even in the crowd you probably just heard lots of screaming and an occasional guitar and maybe a cymbal now and again but they would have drowned out the Beatles, but they still put on A1 performances of the songs so that they sounded like the record. So I'm just gonna be pointing out a few things about this live performance, how they've arranged it on guitar in terms of George just changing what he's playing compared to John, the way that it is just dripping in melody and the same melody is repeated throughout the whole song. The other thing is that with the Beatles, you got so much in about two to two and a half minutes of a song and they just 
broke the rule book. Not that there is a rule book. They're the first ones that really did rip up any rule book that there was with songs and having to have an intro, then a verse, then a pre-chorus, then a chorus, then back into a verse, and then having a middle eight and you bridge towards the end of the song, three quarters of the way through. They would just put everything everywhere. And that's why you had to hear the songs again once you've listened to them because they're so packed with melody, but because your brain wasn't used to the sequence. It can't remember what happened. So you have to go back to the beginning, listen to it again, and even still your brain would say, well, was that the bridge there? Was that the verse? Or was that a chorus? Uh, so it just had so much replayability listening to the songs. But uh, I just want to point out this with Paul, the way that when we're getting into the first chorus, he does the ooze, but he's not doing the ooze. The ooze come along later, but he's so relaxed, so confident that he still just mouths it because he knows it's coming up later. Just like that, just mouthing the ooh uh, before he gets there. So it's that kind of thing that just endears the band to you because they're so happy when they're performing they're obviously so comfortable with it and Paul's so into it as well playing bass by the way just another thing that will fly under the radar is the fact that these guys are playing and singing at the same time and they're rolling so many different skills into one band and when I say that for example, I did a video recently on the Mills Brothers and they were a quartet, very much like a barbershop quartet, singing in harmony with each other. And then they sadly lost their brother and went down to a trio and then their dad got involved back to a quartet, but then went back to a trio again. And talking about the Beatles, you would say that this is like a trio that would be like a barbershop quartet if there were four of them, but the trio vocally, what they've got going on here, we've got constant harmony lines and they're all singing with each other. It's not as if we just have a chorus and that's when maybe one other singer will get involved and harmonize. They're throwing it in all over the place and they are super accurate with their pitch and just perfectly rehearsed, as I said earlier. But the vocals are on that different level of being that barbershop quality in terms of the harmonies with each other. The instrumental ability is on a different level when you're listening to what Paul's doing on the bass here. Having that alternating bass line the whole time singing at the same time. You've got George playing the different voicings and the chords playing a little bit of lead in there. And then you've got John again uh, supplying great harmonies and great rhythm guitar underneath what George is doing. So there is so much going on and just on top of all of that you've got Ringo Starr behind that drum kit doing something that is so unique just the way that he played the drums but listen out for the way that he plays the drums in the chorus because it's totally different to what you're expecting just a straight beat he doesn't play it straight and he just always does something interesting that a lot of other drummers wouldn't do and that's the point that he just i don't think he thought outside the box he just played the way that he played and that's the best way to approach any instrument and pretty much anything in life just do it your own way and you will be unique and i know that he was a left-handed drummer playing a right-handed kit or at least playing the way that you would do right-handed so Having that organization meant that he was doing things in a different way to a lot of other drummers because they would just play right-handed on their kit set up for a right-handed player, but then Ringo is playing left-handed on a kit set up for a right-handed player. So just quickly jumping into this song, a lot of people will demonstrate this playing the E minor down at the bottom, um, which gives you access to the that high E string, third fret, second fret, open string to do the rundown and the melody that just runs throughout this song over to the A7, same thing here. You've got access to that third fret, second fret, open E to the C if you want to. You can still keep that in there. You'd have to move your second finger over into then the G like that. I think John's playing the full G here. You can, if you want to, 
leave that sixth sound in there. But that's something that we get at the end of the song where they finish vocally, uh, effectively making up a sixth chord at the end with that G. With the open E string. But you'll see in this live performance that it's not played down at the bottom here. We've got John playing the E minor up here. A seventh will be here into the C. This is where George goes, but John goes down to his C at the bottom here, and then John gets into the G down here, but George gets into his G, his bar chord G, because then he goes into his little lead line like that and it's interesting that a lot of people go and, and then they do a little bend in there whereas here if you watch George's hand and in other performances he has this and he kind of slides up and down and then pulls off kind of like that before getting into what would be the G again where we've got into our verse here Minor, B minor, D, and then G. So that was it. That's the verse. G, E minor, B minor, D. Okay, right. First point that I want to make here about the guitars and the way that George he really focuses on the top end of the guitar with his G chord he actually flicks on that high E string in order to do the rundown and this is totally separate to the rest of the rhythm so if you're playing your E minor down here what's happening is George is actually going up and picking three strings of the E minor but a shape that moves a little bit higher up so if you imagine your D minor a couple of frets further up is the E minor but this means that the melody gets highlighted this na 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 that so rather than just hearing a single note of the melody we've now got effectively a few chord shapes and three strings at a time that are going to emphasize like that by the time we then get into the C minor into the D oh D seventh and then uh, back into the E minor again that same same thing there kind of like that just to show you guys what I'm talking about have a listen to George the way that he descends on the G and then descends on the E minor again we can't see his hand very clearly but you'll be able to hear it there on the G he's already doing this little rundown before E minor and on the E minor he's very deliberate with that he's kind of slowing down that right hand to get the melody just to stick out a little bit more and remember that John on the other rhythm guitar he's not doing that same slow action so it means it's going to separate those two guitars up and you'll be able to hear that melody really clearly and when we hear it in the chorus of course it's sticking out it's something it's so hooky that is just going to stay in your head and the Beatles were just the masters of writing hooks and things would just stick in your head just the guys in a nutshell when I said about them having so many different abilities just put to the top of that list songwriting because that is something that is so difficult to perfect and be consistent with to write stuff that is always going to hit a chord with an audience is going to be catchy have loads of hooks in there have great vocals and melodies going on and not be overly technical but to sit it in a place where people can relate to it songwriting is so difficult and to have all of these things 
rolled into one with the vocals that I mentioned, the melody, the guitar playing, Josh Harrison playing lead, and uh, John Lennon as well playing rhythm, and a little bit of lead as well with Paul's bass playing, singing at the same time, Ringo Starr being totally unique on the drum kit. Add songwriting into that, and that's why these guys were the ultimate, and arguably, I know that a lot of fans would just say, yeah, the best band of all time that there's ever been, but this is why they're in that conversation and pretty much always at the top of that conversation for best ever band because of not just being great at one thing. You've got to take lots of things into consideration and songwriting is a huge part of it because you can be the best band in the world at playing your instruments, singing, harmonizing with each other, but if you can't write a song that connects with people, then you're always going to struggle. You're not going to get to the top of the charts, you're not going to sell millions of albums because everyone else would think, oh yeah, these guys are good, but I could write a better song than that. And <laughs> this is certainly something that you can't say about the Beatles. They are so consistent live. So this is the thing about their performances, the way that they just brought that live performance into the studio rather than I think a lot of bands have the issue of bringing the studio to live and that's where they trip up because they're making the transition the other way whereas the Beatles were a great live band who just got in the studio and sounded like they did live and that's just the record that got pressed is what you heard then performing live and that's why they just sound exactly like the record obviously the amount of rehearsal live rehearsal that's gone into this is just off the charts, just doing it for years and years and years, and just night after night after night, you can see the way that they interact with the crowd, smiling, making eye contact, it's like bringing the crowd on stage with them for the performance, that's effectively what it feels like when you watch the Beatles perform live, and even watching back at these videos, you still get that sense that you are on stage with them, so you get that whole entertainment side of it, check out this whole video if you do get a chance, I'm not sure how long it'll be on YouTube for. It's a shame if it does get taken down, but I can see it did get uploaded just at the end of last month. So it hasn't been up a long time. It might get seen uh, by the Universal Records bots that are out there and get taken down. So I don't know how long this is going to stay on there, but I will upload it and maybe have to re-edit it if it does get blocked. But thank you guys for requesting this video for me to take a look at. Keep the suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock!